So as the last speaker of the night, I certainly recognize and appreciate the effort that it takes for you to hang around, stick around after the break, and hang around to the very last talk. So uh, it's my duty to thank you very much for staying tonight. And I also want to thank Peter for inviting me to be here. Uh, also as the last speaker, I'm acutely aware of my duties to make sure that I not keep you later than the scheduled end time. And I'm also fully aware that uh, I'm sure that you'll appreciate if I were to go a little bit shorter than planned and not feel shortchanged at the end. So I'll do my best to succeed on all of those points. So given that we're at about 8.30 or so on a Tuesday night, I've decided I'd tell you all a bedtime story. And the title of my bedtime story is Modeling and Acceptance Criteria for Seismic Design and Analysis of Tall Buildings. Now compared to the level of detail that Ron Clemensic went into in preliminary design, you're going to find that I'm going to zoom in down to a near microscopic level, which you might find very appropriate for bedtime. <laughs> but I'd like to urge you to try to stay awake to the end of the story. I think you might find that this story has a happy ending. And while we don't answer every possible question you could have, I think that you're going to find that we answer quite a few questions. And in the end, I think I'll, I'll show you that something that I think is fairly remarkable about what we've done in this document and, and achieved with this team. So thank you all very much for your attention. So what I hope to do is introduce our ATC 72-1 document to you. I'm going to describe nonlinear analysis modeling issues in great detail. And I'm going to present our modeling recommendations. So before I can do that, I've got to tell you who are the players in this story and what this story is about. So our role on this project was actually one of many peer tasks. Uh, we, we were task seven on the overall Tall Buildings Initiative project. And our project team was called the Task 7 Project Core Group, which included these folks here. We were led by Jim Malley as our project technical director. And you'll notice that many of these names found their way onto the actual guidelines development team, all with the exception of me, primarily. But I'm not bitter. <laughs> what we did was conduct, the first thing we did was conduct a workshop on tall building seismic design and analysis issues. We assembled a whole bunch of people involved in the process, practitioners, researchers, and building officials, and we identified a whole bunch of issues related to seismic design and analysis of tall buildings. The issues were big, some of them were small, but all of them were used to seed the work that we were doing on our recommendations document. Some of the things that we talked about or, or discovered in the workshop had to do with quantification of inelastic material properties, recommendations for acceptance criteria, guidance on damping and P-delta effects, and modeling of podium and diaphragm and backstay effects specific to tall buildings. So we took all that information and prepared our HC 72-1 report. It included a number of things that might look very similar to what we found in the workshop, which is by design. Of course, we have the all-important Chapter 1 introduction. Chapter 2, we spend a great deal of time talking about nonlinear modeling in general. And then the rest of the document talks very specifically about recommendations for how to model specific components in tall buildings. Upon completion of our report, we also solicited the input from an expert review panel, including these names here. Uh, this group generated a list of over 300 technical comments that we responded to, and this group had a very real effect and impact on the final, uh, the shape of the final recommendations included in our report. So in order to talk about specifics of recommended modeling parameters and acceptance criteria, we quickly realized we needed to talk in general about nonlinear model, nonlinear modeling. Uh, the parameters that you use to develop nonlinear component properties and, and why those properties are important. So the types of models that exist right now with our current technologies uh, range anywhere from what we call continuum or physical models all the way to what we call 
concentrated hinge, or phenomenological models. The continuum models are based on, are, are like finite elements. They're based on nonlinear material behaviors like material stress strain relationships, and they're used based on these building blocks to build up the overall section behavior. In contrast, the phenomenological models or concentrated hinge models are based on observed force def deformation behaviors or phenomena that we observe from tests. These two types of nonlinear models have different advantages and disadvantages. And in the case of continuum models, if you're looking to simulate material crack, the, ad the incidence of material cracking or the incidence of yielding, continuum models can be good for that. The disadvantage to that, though, is they have limited capabilities of capturing degradation. On the other hand, concentrated hinge models have that ability to capture degradation that, that were observed in tests. And they have the added advantage that concentrated hinge models are consistent with the types of force, deformation, and limit state checks that we, do, that we use in our codes and standards and eventually used in the guidelines. The limitation there is that the behavioral relationships in concentrated hinge models are more empirical rather than theoretical. So they're limited to what you have seen in tests. You can't use concentrated hinge models to uh, discover things that you didn't already know about because you've tested them and you knew them and then you've modeled them. So based on those advantages and disadvantages, our group decided to focus primarily on the, the phenomenological aspects, the concentrated hinge or even the distributed plasticity models. And, to, and in the case of a concentrated hinge model, there's a couple of important pieces. There's an initial monotonic backbone curve. And on that curve, you're trying to capture the hardening, the primary hardening and softening response of the, com of the component. You need to add to that the cyclic response model. And in the cyclic response model, you're trying to capture the strength and stiffness deterioration uh, hysteretic response of the component. Both those pieces are needed to get the thing right. And when you're talking about hysteretic behavior, there are modes of cyclic deterioration that we have, that we explicitly defined. Item number one is basic strength deterioration, and that's where the peak strength in each successive cycle is decreasing. As each cycle goes through, the peak strength that is reached is less. Type two is post-capping strength deterioration, which is the point after the peak strength. Uh, and in each successive cycle, the post-capping strength is decreasing and moving in towards the origin. And type three is unloading stiffness deterioration in which as a, as a system is unloaded in each successive cycle, the stiffness is uh, reducing. So when you want to model explicitly nonlinear hysteretic behavior, you need all these pieces. You need a backbone curve or a reference force deformation relationship defining the bound, what's called the force displacement capacity boundary within which the hysteretic response of the, of the component is constrained. You need a set of rules that define the basic char characteristics of the hysteretic behavior. And you need a set of rules that define the various modes of deterioration with respect to the backbone curve, such as the peak strength deterioration and the post-capping strength deterioration and how, tho how those peak strengths move in towards the origin in each successive cycle. You need, you need rules to define all of those. Along the way, we've learned some very important lessons about hysteretic behavior and our, and our previous thinking about that. Okay? Uh, in, in, to determine the force displacement capacity boundary, it's often taken as the initial monotonic backbone curve. In general, not always the case, but in general, when components undergo cyclic, um, cyclic loading, their response is always is usually less than or equal to the monotonic response. So the best that they can get is the, the static push monotonic force displacement relationship. Depending upon the, the cyclic loading protocol, the cyclic envelope, which is the envelope within which the, the component, the hysteretic response uh, behaves, 
Sometimes that matches the capacity boundary, like the figure on the left. But mo more often than not, the cyclic envelope is actually different from the, the monotonic backbone curve. If you look at the figure on the right, you can see in this instance, the actual force displacement capacity boundary is, is out beyond the element. And you could imagine if you have that actual capacity and you run a cyclic loaded protocol on an element, you would, in the early cycles, we're, we're bouncing up against the force displacement capacity boundary and cycling back. But in the later cycles, we reach a point where you could, choose, you could either hit the force displacement capacity boundary or you could choose to unload, in which case the component will cycle back and never actually reach that full force displacement capacity boundary. So you can see, in this case, the cyclic envelope is different from the monotonic backbone curve. And because of the dependence on the actual loading protocol, the cyclic envelope is not a unique characteristic of the component. It's actually a load-dependent characteristic of the component. And finally, what was v what's very important to know is that the ASCE 41 curves, in general, as they were conceived and originally developed, were based on cyclic load tests. So the backbone curves and the parameters that you see in ASCE 41 when they were based on tests, were based on tests that were done cyclically to some specific loading protocol. And they may or may not be based on um, monotonic pushes. And they may, or, uh, they may and could and are most likely very conservative with regard to the force displacement capacity boundary. So as Ron alluded to, there's, um, we came up with four basic options of how you can model nonlinear component behavior. They're based on what you know and how accurate you think you need to be in your analysis. Option one is the explicit incorporation of cyclic deterioration in the model. Option two is the use of the cyclic envelope. I'll explain that in a sec. Option three is the use of some kind of modified or factored initial backbone curve. And option four is, is actually not considering deterioration or all, at all in the model. In the case of option one, if you're going to if you're going to explicitly model deterioration, you need to know two things. You need to know that initial backbone curve, and then you need to know the cyclic deterioration characteristics of the component. We think that that's the best way, the best we can do. Okay, and so and if you're doing this kind of analysis, there's no limitations on the use of this kind of uh, of this kind of model. In option two, use of the cyclic envelope, the cyclic behavior of the element is known from tests. You don't necessarily have the monotonic test to go along with it. So all you know is that you've run some cyclic loading protocol, and you can presume that the, the, the cyclic envelope represents some kind of degraded cyclic response. If you use that as a basis for your nonlinear modeling, no further deterioration is included in the model. You, you run your components within this envelope here. And when you're running this kind of analysis, you want to make sure that your deformations don't exceed the envelope that you've established by the test. So you keep your, um, as Ron explained, you make sure that your analysis is, is valid within the range of, of anticipated behavior, and the anticipated behavior is what you observed in your cyclic tests. In option three, the use of the modified or factored backbone in this case, you know the backbone, but you don't necessarily know the, the explicit cyclic deterioration behavior. So what we have is based on empirical factors of other tests that uh, are available in the literature. We've developed factors that can be used to, to adjust the backbone properties to, pr to create the modifying backbone to be used as the, as the cyclic envelope for your elements. Once, you do, once you've created the modified backbone curve, you again don't include any further deterioration in the analytical model. And in this case, the deformations in your model should not exceed the modified backbone parameters that you've created based on these factors. And finally, there could be a situation where the deterioration parameters are not known or just not needed, depending upon the level of analysis or the level of accuracy you need in your analysis. Okay? In this case, we set a conservative limit 
on how far you should push your elements and you keep your deformations below some conservative value uh, relative to the point which you think degradation will begin based on what you know. So at the component level, in terms of the acceptance criteria that you've heard uh, mentioned a couple of times, we considered two performance states, two behavior states of the components. We call it, one, the onset of structural damage, and that's the service level uh, acceptance criteria. And in the case of onset of structural damage, forces and deformations are, be, are beyond the yield point with some permanent deformation yielding or cracking, but before the capping point. And the points of the, the, the source of all the discussion is how far beyond the yielding point you would be willing to take uh, an element. And in the case of onset of significant degradation, degradation occurs at the, at the capping point, and you want to keep your, your criteria in general um, beyond the capping point, but before the ultimate deformation capacity. And then the sources of discussion are how far beyond that capping point you're willing to take and how close out to the ultimate defor deformation capacity you're willing to go. In terms of P-delta effects in tall buildings, P-delta effects, folks are, are very familiar with the problem. It's a well-known problem. Folks have seen curves very much like many curves like the one on the right, where a model that does not include P-delta continues to rise uh, in terms of, of strength, base shear strength, and a model with P-delta eventually reaches a point where it starts to fall off a cliff. Uh, our document includes recommendations for modeling of P-delta effects. Going through all those would be a bit boring at this point in the evening, so I decided to restrict my comments to um, some high points that were specifically related to conclusions we drew uh, for tall buildings. What we found what there were, was that there was a clear difference between frame versus shear wall systems for the tall building systems we studied. We also found that, uh, might be a bit counterintuitive, but static pushover can be, use, can be useful for identifying sensitivity to P-delta effects. Now I, mentioned, I said useful for identifying sensitivity, not that static pushover should be used to model these types of, of structures but they can be useful for identifying when P-delta effects could be important. We also observe that P-delta effects increase when components are allowed to deteriorate into the post-capping range and at the MCE level of analyses. Um, that's where we are having our components go, so P-delta effects become extra important. And also in the case of tall buildings, P-delta causes the collapse potential of tall frame systems to increase with increasing period. We spent a great deal of time on, a, on the project on damping. It was a highly controversial issue. A number of, number of people on our expert review panel weighed in heavily and uh, did special, actually Graham Powell did some special studies for us with regards to damping. I'm going to summarize some of our conclusions regarding damping. Damping in tall buildings, in any building in general, includes hysteretic and viscous damping effects. Damping that occurs in the structural components due to their yielding is implicit through their hysteretic response. So when you're modeling the nonlinear hysteretic response of your components, you're getting a piece of the damping that occurs in, in the building. Damping from other things, like the gravity framing, the soil foundation structure interaction, and the non-structural components, that, if not explicitly included in the model, can be captured through uh, effective viscous damping. Issues related to tall buildings have to do with the potential to overestimate the viscous damping part and to double count the hysteretic damping, as well as the potential for spurious damping effects in large force imbalances that can happen, especially in, in higher modes. I mentioned this, the study that Graham Powell did for us where he compared uh, effective damping uh, with, uh, between first mode and higher modes as well as initial period and elongated periods after yielding. If, we, if you began with a 4% effective viscous damping and the structure began to yield, it was, it was always observed, almost always observed to grow regardless of the damping formulation. But if you look specifically in the higher modes, 
Stiffness proportional damping tends to significantly over damp in the higher modes and mash proportional damping was found to significantly under damp in the higher modes. So the recommendations from our team were to, cons were to, to use Rayleigh type stamping or modal damping uh, and use effective viscous damping on the order of the equations in the upper right. Um, for, for structures less than 30 stories, damp, the effective viscous damping was a coefficient alpha divided by 30. And for structures greater than 30 stories tall, the effective viscous damping was alpha divided by the number of stories, where alpha varied from low damping to high damping from 60 for steel buildings and 120 for concrete buildings. And if you look at how these, this equation, these equations plot on a scatter plot of, of the data, equivalent viscous, viscous damping range from 2 to 4 percent for 30-story buildings and 1 to 2 percent for 70-story buildings. So having established the nonlinear modeling characteristics and what's important, we then set about developing and presenting very specific component modeling recommendations. Four systems were covered in our document. Steel frame components, concrete frame components, concrete shear wall components, and slab column frame components. For steel frame components, we address steel beams, steel columns, and steel panel zones. For concrete frame components, we did concrete beams, concrete columns, and concrete beam column joints. Shear wall components, we address planar walls, flange walls, core walls, and coupling beams. And for slab column frames, we addressed effective beam width recommendations, slab column connections, and slab to core wall connections. For each of those components identified, we went into a discussion about the parameters of interest for those components, the behavioral considerations for each of those parameters, why those parameters are important to the behavior of the component. We collected all the available experimental data we could find on each of those components. We quantified the component properties. We compared analytical results versus experimental results using our current nonlinear modeling techniques. We compared results with ASCE 41 criteria. We developed summary recommendations for how to model these components and, and, and developed acceptance criteria that were keyed to the criteria that were presented in the guidelines by Ron. So obviously, tonight is not the night for me to go through each of these quantities for each of, these, each of the systems that were studied. But what I want to do is highlight what I think to be a fairly remarkable accomplishment from, by this team, specifically related to available, available experimental data and quantification of component properties. In the case of steel frame components, there's been quite a bit of research and, and some very recent research by Lignos and Krawwinkler to collect a large database of steel beam tests. These data were studied for dependence on steel section properties like beam depth, span to depth ratio, uh, flange, to thick, flange width to thickness ratios, and regression equations were developed to quantify the nonlinear properties based on those, on those, param those section properties in the absence of any test data. Those equations look like this, and I think it's, these, are, these are equations that are based on section property data that you can use to develop nonlinear component properties that you would otherwise need testing to develop. Things like plastic rotation, post capping plastic rotation, cumulative plastic deformations. So in, in the absence of tests, our recommendations clearly are if you have important components and important buildings that you should develop your nonlinear properties based on tests. But we have a set of equations for engineers to use in the absence of tests. Not to be outdone, similarly on the concrete frame side, recent research by Hazelton and others in 2008, that was a large database of, of concrete column test data, 
also looked at for various concrete section properties and material properties and other regression equations were developed and those equations look like this including equations for effective stiffness pre-capping and post-capping plastic rotations so I find these results to be fairly remarkable I hope I hope you do as well and not to be outdone the uh, shear wall sections and slab column moment frames also include similar types of equations for the for their behaviors as well And finally, because it was identified as extremely important in our workshop, we needed to develop recommendations uh, for how to treat podium diaphragms, collectors, and backstay effects in these buildings. I'm sure most of you know, but many, in case you don't, the podium effect, the backstay effect is similar to the backspan of a cantilever. It's caused by interaction between the tower and the larger structure of the podium that could be above grade. In general, it's below grade. It has to do, it has to do with a relative rigidity problem and a load path and force transfer problem. And it's very similar to the propped reaction on a, on a cantilever, that main backstay diaphragm can, can develop very large transfer forces. So in our document, we provide guidance on very specifically on how to develop the collector forces and consider the very real eccentricities between the diaphragm and the shear walls. And we developed a capacity-based um, process for doing a bounding solution for how to uh, develop what we consider to be a, a safe, relatively safe um, designed for addressing the load path that could happen between the, the, the tower structure and the podium. It includes a series of uh, tables with uh, effective stiffness assumption properties for components like the concrete diaphragms um, in the podium uh, and the soil properties below the podium, as well as effective stiffness properties for in, in the tower structure uh, for the core wall, the frames, uh, or the shear walls, uh, as well as the supporting mat foundation and the soils below the mat foundation. There's two low cases presented and, a, and an approach that presented on how to, uh, how to address a uh, bounding solution for the design of the interaction. And with that, I'm sure I've reached very close to all of your bedtimes and I've reached the end of my story. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, I thought we would have a little bit of time for questions, uh, given that uh, uh, we're back pretty much on schedule. I think if you have some specific questions, uh, ask the authors and try and uh, get them to stay around for a little bit more. Uh, we do have a question and answer session on uh, Thursday, so uh, write down your questions so you remember them. But uh, ideally, what happens on Thursday is now you have the technical background for the guidelines, but on Thursday we'll have uh, this applied to some applications. Uh, Yusef mentioned there were three case study buildings. Two of those are going to be presented in detail. Jack Maley is going to lay them, uh, the case study buildings out in some uh, detail. Um, we're going to look at the um, ground motions that were picked for the case studies to go through that process uh, and how those were developed then uh, some modeling uh, of the two case studies uh, and then the analysis of them and then we'll end uh, with uh, Ron Hamburger uh, going through the performance evaluation so not just the drifts and things like that but what is the expected cost of damage and uh, downtime and that sort of thing so uh, today was sort of the theoretical basis Thursday we'll look at the, the actual practical nuts and bolts of the applications and what the results show us so anyway thank you all for coming tonight and uh, uh, look forward to seeing you on Thursday. All of the presentations in order to save trees uh, are, are not out in a little binder, but they are on the peer website. So uh, if you go home and uh, tomorrow you can download the, the PDFs of the, all the presentations and uh, refer to them as you want.
So uh, we'll uh, put a note on that on Thursday as well, but I forgot to mention that in the beginning. So all of these are on the PEER website under events uh, for them this seminar. So anyway, good evening and safe traveling home. And thanks to all the speakers. I thought they did a wonderful job. <laughs>